So last time we talked about Faust, uh, that's where we were. So, uh, so we had a sawtooth wave and we had an envelope uh, generator uh, multiplied to the sawtooth wave. And I'm sure that most of you already did the lab at this point. Uh, so you probably know uh, about all that kind of stuff. And, and basically today I'm gonna just continue to do what's in the lab, you know, but, uh, but I feel like uh, it will be useful for you to, uh, to hear what I have to say about this, you know, like because uh, the, the lab doesn't necessarily have a lot of uh, details. So, uh, so that's what we're gonna do. Uh, that's what we're gonna do uh, today. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna turn polyphony on for that example. You know, like so once again, it was just an ADSR envelope generator and multi multiplied to a sawtooth wave, and uh, and then we split that into two signals so that we get signal on both ears, left and right. Okay, so uh, so if you run this, uh, you can control the program with the keyboard. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, not clicking in the right place. Okay, so here I'm controlling the synthesizer with the keyboard. Okay. So uh, one thing that I wanted to show you here, uh, which is pretty uh, pretty important, uh, because uh, I know that some of you uh, already submitted their assignments and uh, and they sort of made the mistake, but it's normal because they didn't know about it until now, or unless you actually read the lab. But, uh, but when you make a polyphonic object uh, in Faust, uh, there is something that is important to know about, uh, which is the uh, effect uh, line. And, uh, and so, uh, so basically the effect line in Faust uh, sort of plays the same role as the process line uh, when you're in polyphony mode. But what it does is that everything that goes on the process line will be duplicated every time you start a new voice for your uh, synthesizer. So, so say you're, pre you're pressing three keys on the keyboard, then everything that is on the process line uh, will be duplicated three times, okay? And everything that is on the effect line uh, only happens once, okay? And, uh, and that's uh, to save some computation because for example, uh, in uh, what I'm gonna do here, if you add a reverb to your synthesizer uh, and uh, you know that Zeta light is, uh, is a reverb, if you already did the lab, you know about that. Um, so, uh, so what happens here is that Zeta is only created once, okay? And, uh, and then uh, the various voices that you will create with your synthesizer will all go to Zeta lights, okay? And so you could also write something where uh, you put Zeta lights uh, here, you know, and that works, you know, that works. And, uh, and uh, you know, then you can get rid of this line. Uh, and and that, that, that totally works too, you know, like the only problem if you do that is that for every voice you're going to need on your synthesizer, uh, you're going to recreate a reverb and that's completely useless, you know, because uh, if you were uh, in a room uh, where uh, you're uh, pressing uh, multiple keys on a, on a piano keyboard, for example, then there are multiple strings for each key you're going to press, right? Uh, but there is only one room. Right, uh, the room uh, in which the the, the keyboard uh, is right, and uh, and so here it's the same idea, you know. Like, I mean, there is no point creating multiple rooms uh, while you could use the same room. Okay, so everything you put on the effect line uh, is only computed uh, once, and uh, and then uh, everything you put on the process line uh, is what actually gets duplicated when you uh, have a polyphony. Okay. So here, if I run the program uh, again, you can hear that now there is some reverb uh, in the sound that I'm uh, synthesizing. Okay, and uh, this envelope is kind of annoying because it has a very long attack. So I'm gonna uh, make it shorter. Ah, no. Okay, sorry about that. Nice, okay. So you see that it works and, uh, and that's the way you should do it basically. So, uh, so if you have audio effects uh, and, uh, and they're all the same for all the voices, there is no point putting them on the process line, but you wanna put them on the effect line and, uh, and that's a much better uh, choice. And uh, here it's still important to have the splits uh, with the two signals in parallel because Zeta light is actually a stereo 
reverb in Faust. So it takes two inputs. And, um, and so you sort of want to make sure that whatever is on the process line has the same number of outputs as the number of inputs of what's on the uh, effect line. Okay. And uh, do, do you have any questions about that or? Cool. Okay. So, so, uh, so yeah. sorry, quick question. So, so did you, you replace the, the Z, the, the filter with the underscore comma underscore, is that correct? Um, yeah, well, so, uh, so once again, so, uh, so Zeta light here, uh, could totally be, uh, here, you know, like, I mean, the result in the end is the, is the same, like from, um, from an audio standpoint, you hear the same thing. Okay. Uh, the only thing is if you do what I did here, you know, like by creating an effect line, okay. And, uh, and effect, effect only works in polyphony mode, right? Like if you're not in polyphony mode, if you're in, if you have mono here, then the effect line is just ignored basically. Okay. And so here, what's happening is that if you have multiple voices, which are created when you press on the keys, like three, four, five voices, they all go to the same zeta light here. Well, if zeta light was here, then it, it would be duplicated for every e key you're going to press. Yeah. Right. All right. Sorry. My, my question was much more primitive, which is what, what is the underscore comma underscore? Mean. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Okay. So, so the, the uh, yeah, like so. Basically, this says that there are two signals. Okay. So, uh, so, so what we do here is that we take the output uh, of this line, and then we split it into two signals. Okay. So, so this basically just duplicates the signal twice. Okay. And uh, and uh, and that's how we get actually two arrows here, right? So so if we didn't have that here, then we have uh, an object which has only uh, one output. Okay, and now it has two outputs. Okay, and the effect line will automatically apply whatever is in that to to the yes, process. Absolutely. Okay, you don't have to do any plumbing. Okay. No. And uh, but that only works if you are in polyphony mode. Like if you're in mono mode, uh, then the Zeta uh, reverb here, like the effect line is just ignored, basically. So uh, yeah. Thank you. Cool. So uh, one thing that is important to uh, notice here, uh, I don't know if you heard it, but uh, when I uh, press the keys, well, it, it sounds kind of cool, you know, like, but, uh, but every time I press a key, there is this bang, 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 you know, like it's not like stable at the beginning, you know, like, you know, it's like, well, 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 you know, like it, it's like, uh, we don't start on the right pitch, you know, and then it, it suddenly goes up or down, you know, you can, uh, and, and, and maybe, you know, that's something that we want, you know, but, uh, but the reason why we're getting this here is because, uh, the frequency slider, uh, is currently being smooth, okay, and uh, and and that's something that we want uh, in the case where we don't have a polyphonic effect, right? If we don't have a polyphonic effect, we don't want to have clicks when we move the slider. So we uh, so we use the smooth uh, here, uh, but in the case of the polyphonic synthesizer. We want to have the pitch uh, of the note immediately, right? And so here, because the default pitch is 400 hertz, okay? And, uh, and if I press on a new key on the keyboard, uh, then I just uh, tell uh, the frequency slider to go to a different frequency. It will always start from 400 and then slide to the frequency um, that I'm designating with the key I'm pressing on the, on the computer keyboard. And, uh, and because there is the smoothing, uh, it's sliding between those, uh, those two, right? So, uh, so if I want to get rid of these, uh, wah, 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 you know, like, uh, sound like, uh, then, uh, then I need to get rid of the smooth here. And, uh, and now if I press the, the keys again, well, it's way more boring than what we had before, but, uh, it's more accurate, uh, somehow, you know, like, uh, and, uh, and once again, you know, like maybe you like the, the smooth, you know, uh, like from an um, uh, aesthetic standpoint, uh, that's what you want, you know, like, but, uh, 
like you have to be aware of that, you know, like, so, so if you're creating a polyphonic synthesizer, in fact, there is no point putting any uh, smooth uh, anywhere, basically, uh, at least on the freak gain and gate parameters, you know, and because those parameters, you want to have their value like right away because they're uh, directly match the key you're pressing. Okay. That any any questions about that or cool. Okay, so uh, let me uh, get back to mono mode uh, here, and uh, the um, next thing I wanted to talk to you about is filtering. And uh, and once again, you know, like if you did the lab, you already know sort of uh, about that kind of stuff, you know. Like, but uh, but there are a few uh, important things that are not necessarily part of the lab, and uh, that I want to tell you about uh, here. So uh, let me get rid of the effect line because we're not going to use it anymore uh, here. Okay, and uh, okay. So in sound synthesis, uh, there is a sound synthesis technique, uh, which is very widely used uh, in uh, music technology, which is called subtractive sound synthesis. And, uh, and the idea behind subtractive sound synthesis is that uh, you take a signal which has a lot of harmonics in it, so a very broadband signal, you know, and a, and a sawtooth oscillator is a very good example of that. A sine wave, for example, only has one harmonic in it, so, so it's completely point, pointless to, uh, to put a sine wave through a filter, you know, because it's like if you're changing the gain of the sine wave. So, uh, so subtractive synthesis only works uh, on very broadband signals, so like a sawtooth wave, a noise generator, a triangle wave, and, uh, and so that's why here we're going to keep the sawtooth wave for the, the next um, example. And uh, so in subtractive synthesis, what we do is that we take this very broadband signal uh, and then we filter it uh, using uh, a filter. And uh, depending on the shape uh, of the frequency response of the filter, uh, the sound which will result out of it uh, will be, uh, will be uh, different. Okay. So, uh, so in general, in sound synthesis, uh, and once again, if you did the lab, uh, you probably know about what I'm uh, talking about here, and I hope you did the lab already. Uh, but um, in a, in a, usually there are three different types of filters. There are low pass filters, which basically let low frequencies uh, pass, okay, and then they cut high frequencies. There are high pass filters, which do the opposite. They let high frequencies pass and, uh, and they cut low frequencies. And then there are band pass filters, uh, which uh, highlight a zone of the spectrum and uh, get rid of low, the lowest frequencies and of the highest frequencies around it. Okay. So in, uh, in Faust, uh, there are many uh, different types of low pass filters and of uh, high pass filters and of band pass filters. But usually uh, the two main types of filters that are used for that, like the two big families of filters are what we call resonant filters or Butterworth uh, filters, okay? So, so it's basically uh, resonant filters and uh, Butterworth uh, filters. Okay, and, uh, and the main difference between uh, resonant filters and Butterworth filters is that resonant filters are gonna have a resonance, okay? So not only they're gonna act as low pass or high pass or uh, band pass filters, but they're actually gonna resonate at a specific frequency. So, so they're kind of gonna highlight a part uh, of the spectrum uh, of the spectrum of the sound. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, Butterworth uh, filters uh, don't have this little bump in the spectrum, so they don't have this resonance. And, uh, and so they are much less, uh, they're much more passive in a way, you know? And, uh, and uh, if you look for a resonant uh, uh, low pass uh, filter, and uh, you look for, uh, for that, uh, probably you will end up uh, on uh, maybe Judas's uh, website, or uh, you can take uh, any of these pictures, you know, and so that's what I'm talking about here. This is the resonance, okay? So this is a low pass filter because it basically cuts uh, high frequencies. 
and it lets uh, low frequencies go through the filter. But there is also this little bump here uh, in the in the spectrum, you know, like so it highlights part of the part of the sound. Okay, and then on the other hand, uh, Butterworth filters they don't have the bump, you know, like they're uh, they just have like this very flat uh, shape, uh, and uh, and so they're maybe a little less interesting to use for uh, musical uh, for musical purpose. Okay. So let me let me uh, try to use uh, one of those filters here, and uh, and typically the one that people probably use the most uh, is the resonant low pass filter, and in Faust uh, uh, you will find it in the filters library. Once again, F I stands for filters, and then resin L P is for resonant low pass filter. And, uh, and you see that here I used uh, a colon and the colon is used here to connect uh, everything that I have here to resin LP, to my resonant uh, low pass filter. And, um, and so, uh, so if I look at the documentation of this filter, uh, of this function, I will see that uh, it has uh, three parameters. The, the first parameter is, the, is what we call the cutoff frequency okay? or center frequency. You know, like, so that, that's basically the frequency where the bump is and where the filter is going to start acting as a low pass filter. Uh, then we have the Q and, uh, and we have the gain. So what is the Q? The Q is basically the is basically the width of the bump of the resonance that we just talked about. So the higher the Q, the narrower the the, the bump is going to be, and the more resonance the filter is going to be is going to be. So let me let me show let me show that to you. So uh, so for my cutoff frequency here, I'm going to use for example 1,000 hertz. And uh, for my Q, I'm going to use seven. And for the gain, I'm going to use uh, one. Okay. So now if I run uh, the program uh, and uh, I will replace uh, my button here by a checkbox so that when I click on it, it keeps, uh, making, uh, keeps making sound. Okay. So uh, here, if I increase the frequency of the filter, you can hear that now I have more high frequency uh, harmonics. And if I put it very low, say at 500 hertz, then the, the like basically many, many of the harmonics after 500, uh, 500 actually are removed from the, the spectrum of the sound that we are generating. So now we have a way more uh, 10 uh, sound. Okay. And uh, let me get rid of the zoom window here, uh, which is kind of on my way. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, so now if I if you click on this, you know, and uh, and if we uh, look uh, here at the spectrogram of the sound that we are uh, hearing, you can see that uh, there are more low frequencies in the signal than high frequencies. Okay, so so this is the frequency axis here, and this is gain. And, uh, and you can see that if I increase the value of uh, my cutoff frequency, and I start that again, we now have the little bump that I was just talk telling you about. Okay, and that's the, the, little, uh, the little bump uh, of our resonant uh, filter. And then we have the decrease uh, in harmonics of the signal, which come after that. So, um, so it works. Cool. So, um, what uh what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna uh, add some uh, sliders to control uh, the cutoff uh, cutoff frequency and uh, and in fact uh, you know like just to save some time I'm just gonna copy and paste uh, what's in the lab for that uh, just so that uh, things are a little bit faster so so if you go in the lab you know like here I'm just doing an example of the lab right so uh, so that's why I just copied uh, and pasted uh, this. So this is my cutoff frequency, and uh, and I'm gonna replace 5,000 here by CD uh, freak, which is the cutoff frequency of my uh, of my uh, filter. So now I can control. So. The reason why uh, I said that from uh, uh, 
like an aesthetic standpoint, uh, using resonant filters is maybe better than Butterworth is because you get this wow, 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 wow. You know, like, so, so with Butterworth filter, you don't really get that. You don't get like this little resonance uh, in the sound, you know? And, uh, and so CT Freak is the, is the, the, the cut of frequency, but uh, we haven't tried uh, the Q yet, you know? And so if I put a very high Q, and a very high Q is gonna be like a, a Q, like greater than 30, you know, like, and there is a point where a Q uh, stops having an impact on the sound, you know, like, so whether you put 30 or 100 or 2000, it's probably not really gonna make a huge difference. Uh, however, a Q uh, between seven and 30 is gonna make a pretty big, uh, a pretty big difference. So, uh, so here I have a much more, aggressive resonance. I don't know if you hear it, you know, but it's almost like my computer is whistling. And uh, it's because we're really highlighting a specific harmonic in the spectrum of the sound that we are generating, you know, so it's almost like we have a sine wave there uh, that we hear in the generated uh, signal. And on the other hand, if I make you smaller, say like two, uh, then we sort of lose uh, the effect of the resonance. And now our resonant filter sounds much more like a Butterworth filter, okay? And, uh, and we have less of this uh, aggressive resonance, you know? And so, so usually a good number for that, you know, is something between five and seven, you know? Like if you wanna hear the resonance, but it's not too aggressive. And, uh, and so, uh, so that's, uh, that's a good value for, uh, that's a good value for it. Um, so, so that's for the resonant uh, low pass filter. Now, instead of using a resonant low pass filter, uh, you could use a high pass filter. And for that, uh, you just have to turn resin LP into resin HP. And, uh, and then it's just the opposite. And uh, for bend pass, you can use BP. And honestly, usually, like for uh, what we do here, uh, the low pass uh, kind of sounds better, depending on what you're what you want to do. You know, like, but uh, but if you want to make like something that sounds like an '80s uh, type synthesizer, uh, that's what you uh, that's what you want to use basically. Resin uh, resin LP with the low pass version of the of the filter. Um, so that's for uh, resonant filters. But uh, do you have any uh, questions um, about uh, that so far? Yeah, Ramon, could you just briefly, um, briefly just tell us a little bit more about what a harmonic is? <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, that's and uh, like why why a sine wave only has one. Okay. I thought you could sort of just like multiply or like have sort of, yeah, I don't know. No, 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 no. That that's a, that's a good question, you know, and uh, and uh, it, thank you for asking it, you know, because I I sort of took it for granted that many people knew about that, you know, like, but uh, but uh, okay. Thanks for thanks for asking the the question. Okay. So uh, let me let me just create a new file here, uh, and uh, I'm gonna call it uh, harmonics. And uh, I'm going to use that one as the example for uh, what we're uh, doing uh, here. Okay. And uh, so I'm going to import stdfaust.lib uh, because we're going to need it for that. Okay. And here I'm going to use a uh, process. Okay. So if I take a sine wave uh, and uh, I give it a frequency, say 440 hertz. Okay, so this is my uh, sine wave. And, uh, and here on the right window of the, of the, Faust, uh, of the Faust ID, uh, if I run this program and uh, if I click uh, on this uh, little icon here, I can switch between the waveform, okay? And I can uh, also see the, what do we call the, the spectroscope. And, uh, and what we have here is uh, the spectrum of the sound that we are generating. So here uh, we see everything from zero Hertz to 24,000 Hertz. 
And, uh, and you know that humans cannot really hear any sound after 20,000 hertz, okay? So anything that we see here is sort of what we can supposedly uh, hear. And in fact, in practice, uh, everything that we can hear is probably between zero and uh, you know, like somewhere around 16 because we're uh, not so young anymore. And uh, as you get older, you hear high frequencies less and less, okay? So uh, in the case of a sine wave, uh, there is only one harmonic in the signal. So it's what we call a pure tone. A sine wave is a pure tone. It's a very, very specific kind of signal because it only has one harmonic. So a sine wave is a harmonic, okay? And, uh, and so, uh, so here, if I add a frequency slider uh, to control my uh, uh, sine wave, and uh, I call it freak. Okay, there we go. Uh, and give it a frequency for so default is 400, minimum is 50, max is uh, I'm not going to make it too high, otherwise, it's going to be painful. Uh, 3000 and then a uh, one. Okay, and then I use a uh, freak uh, here. Now, if I run the program again, uh, if I move the frequency slider, I'm basically going to move the position of the harmonic in the spectrum of the sound, okay? So once again, a harmonic is basically a sine wave. So now in signal processing, there is this, this thing, which is called uh, Fourier theory, which states that uh, you can decompose any sound into a uh, sum of sine waves, of harmonics. So basically the sound of my voice the sound of a saxophone, the sound of a car in the street, like any sound can be decomposed into a sum of multiple sine waves, which are in parallel of each other's. Okay. So uh, that means that if I want to create a more complex sound than the sound that I'm producing here, which only has one harmonic because there is only one sine wave in it, what I could do is I could put multiple sine waves in parallel and add them. And, uh, and that's what I'm gonna do here. So here I'm gonna create three sine wave oscillators in parallel of each other's, okay? And, uh, and now I'm gonna create what we call a harmonic series. Uh, and for that, I'm gonna multiply uh, the frequency of the second oscillator by two and uh, the frequency of the third oscillator by three, okay? So now we have uh, three oscillators in parallel. Uh, the first one uh, has a frequency of freak. Second one has a frequency of freak multiplied by two. And the third one has a frequency of freak multiplied by three. Now, if I uh, merge uh, those uh, two oscillators into one signal, okay, so I'm adding, I'm summing these three oscillators uh, here into one signal. Uh, now, if I plot the spectrum of this sound that I have here, I will see three harmonics because there are three sine waves. Uh, I can't really do it right away because uh, I need to divide everything here by three. Okay, So here I'm saying that I'm taking the signal that I just merged and I'm dividing the signal that I merged by uh, three. Okay, and, uh, and that's what you see here on the block uh, diagram. And if I don't do that, then my signal is gonna be too loud and it's gonna clip because a sine wave oscillator has the maximum gain uh, that uh, we can have on the computer in Faust. So, uh, so if I add three sine waves together, I need to divide them by three. Otherwise, uh, my sound is gonna be distorted because it's gonna be too loud. So, uh, so now if I run the program again, now I can see that I have three harmonics, three sine waves in parallel in the signal. And uh, if I move the frequency slider, now I can even see them better here, you know, like, and, uh, and so those are my three uh, harmonics. So it means that uh, any sound uh, can be reconstructed using a sum of sine waves. And uh, in the case of my voice, there's probably dozens of sine waves, you know, like dozens of harmonics. And, uh, and uh, if you wanted to reproduce the, the timber uh, of my voice, you probably have to use, yeah, like more than 20 or 30 oscillators if you wanted, if you wanted it to be accurate. But they'd have to be 
sine wave oscillators. So, uh, so that, that does that answer your question or? Yeah, I think so. So each harmonic is just each one of the sine functions in your Fourier decomposition. Absolutely. OK, so it doesn't have anything to do with like a harmony. It's sort of its own thing. The, now the question is even uh, tougher. But um, so I don't know if I'm going to reply to that question because it's uh, but there are links between the two, basically, you know, like okay. between like uh, harmony and uh, and harmonics. Uh, but uh, but I, I feel like that's a, that's a different topic uh here so uh, all right I, I can i can bug you about that later yeah there we go you know i have office uh hours today so uh so maybe uh maybe that would be a good uh time for uh for that uh but uh, but basically uh then if i uh just to finish answering your question you know like if i use a sawtooth uh, wave oscillator here then a sawtooth wave oscillator uh, has uh, multiple sine waves built in. Like it, it's not that the Sawtooth wave oscillator is implemented uh, using uh, sine wave oscillators, but it has harmonics in it, and uh, it has more than just one harmonic. So, so if I run the Sawtooth wave oscillator here, I can see that there are multiple harmonics here, and those are all sine waves. So it means that. I could re-implement my Sawtooth wave oscillator as a series of, uh, well, as a sum of sine waves, basically. And uh, yeah, cool. So uh, let me get back to uh, our uh, previous uh, example with the filters. OK, are, are there any other questions, by the way? Or maybe there are other questions. OK. Uh, wait, no, yeah, that was the example. Sorry about that. So that's where uh, that's where we we stopped. So I talked about uh, resonant filters, uh, but they are also Butterworth uh, filters. And uh, in Faust, uh, and once again, you know, that's part of the lab. But uh, if you say Butterworth, uh, sorry, if you say low pass, sorry about that. If you say low pass, the default low pass in Faust is a Butterworth uh, filter. And so if we look at the parameters of uh, this low pass function, uh, we can see that uh, it has two parameters. The first parameter is the order of the filter. And the second parameter is the cutoff frequency. OK. So uh, let, me, let me put uh, values here uh, for that. You know, I'm going to say that the order, for example, is 3. And uh, the cutoff uh, frequency, I'm just going to reuse my CT freak parameter uh, that I had here. So uh, I'm not going to go into too much details about what the order is, because uh, it's not really the topic of this uh, class today. But, uh, but basically, what you have to know is that the higher the order, uh, the steeper uh, the filter is going to be at its uh, cutoff uh, area, basically. So, uh, so if you want a very, uh, a very smooth uh, low pass filter, you want to have a low order. But if you have, want to have like a very abrupt, very aggressive low pass filter, then you need to have a fairly high order. And another thing you need to know is that the higher the order, the more computation it's going to require. And it's not the case for uh, the resonant uh, filter, but in the case of the little, uh, Butterworth filter, that's how it, uh, how it works. So here, if I run the program uh, again, So you see that it still works as a low pass filter. I still get the wah wah, you know, like getting rid of low of high frequencies here and then slowly adding more high frequencies. But if we look at the spectrum uh, of the sound that we are generating now, we can see that clearly it doesn't have the bump anymore, you know? So, uh, so if you want to have a filter that doesn't have a resonance, uh, you use a Butterworth uh, filter as I did uh, here. And of course, there is the high pass version, uh, which just does the opposite. And I'm not going to talk too much about it here, uh, because that's not really the point uh, of today's uh, class. But uh, there we go. So that's the uh, high pass uh, version. Great. So uh, there are many, 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 many more uh, filters that you can find in the filters library of Faust. 
Uh, and, uh, and if you go in uh, the Faust libraries documentation uh, on the web, like faustlibraries.grab.fr, uh, you will find the documentation of all these filters, you know, and, uh, and there are more than 60 or something like that, you know, like, but basically the one that I showed you here are the ones uh, that you should know about. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and then the other filters are maybe like uh, more primitive or more complex, uh, but also like more uh, exotic in some cases, you know, like so. So the main filters are the one that I just told you, uh, told you about, uh, told you about in Faust. Cool. So um, just to continue here, I'm going to turn this back into a button. Okay. And uh, and so uh, if I click here, okay, there we go. And I'm gonna put uh, back a resonant uh, low pass uh, because I prefer it. Uh, and once again, you know, like those are um, aesthetical uh, things, you know, like you know, then I have CT freak, I have my Q, I'm gonna say seven and uh, I'm gonna put a gain of one. Great. Um, so in general, uh, in uh, sound synthesis, uh, if you want to have sound uh, that uh, sound good uh, and that sound natural, uh, you want to have a sound that actually evolve in time. Okay. And, uh, and currently the, the sound that we're producing here is not really evolving in time. Uh, the amplitude uh, of this sound is evolving uh, because we have an envelope generator and uh, the envelope generator is uh, being applied uh, to, uh, to the sound that we are uh, producing. But the spectrum of the sound uh, is not evolving in time, right? Uh, and, uh, and usually if you want to have sound that actually sound natural, you want to have an evolving spectrum. So a little trick that we're going to do here is that uh, instead of uh, controlling uh, the cutoff frequency of our filter uh, with the slider, we're going to control the cutoff frequency uh, of the filter using the envelope generator that we already have here. So that uh, uh, the louder the sound, the more harmonics we're going to have uh, in the in the sound that we are generating, and the quieter the sound, the less harmonics we'll, we'll uh, have. So here, I'm, for example, going to say that CT freak, you know, that I, uh, once again, it's the cutoff frequency of my resonant uh, low pass uh, filter is going to be equal to my envelope uh, generator. And uh, if you remember what we said last time, uh, envelope, uh, the envelope generator, the ADSR envelope generator here just generates a number between zero and one. Okay, so envelope here is a number between zero and one. So now I can do some mapping on uh, envelope so that uh, I turn it into a frequency. And, uh, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to multiply envelope, say, by 5,000, and I'm going to add 100 to it, okay? So now uh, what I have is I have a CT freak, uh, which is a value between 100 and 5,100, okay? And uh, so, so it means that I can't go lower than 100, Hertz, you know, because uh, if I have a cutoff frequency which is lower than that, we might not hear any sound anymore. You know, like so maybe uh, it's uh, it's not good. Uh, and uh, and then uh, the the value of my cutoff frequency is going to be controlled by uh, the envelope generator. So what happens now if I play? It? So now it does like this, you know, and that's better you know because uh because now i have uh something that sounds uh more natural or or not but but at least it's more interesting because the spectrum of the sound is evolving as i'm uh playing the as i'm playing my uh my uh, instrument so uh just to highlight this a little bit more i'm gonna increase the uh, uh duration of the attack of my uh adsr envelope generator so that uh, it's one second long. So, you know, so what I did here is that I basically automated uh, the control 
of the cutoff frequency of my low pass filter. And, uh, and it sounds better than if it was completely static, you know? And, uh, and so, uh, so now, you know, like with just this very simple synthesizer, uh, playing with uh, the different parameters that I have access to, like the, the duration of the attack, the duration of the release, and uh, the mapping that I have here, you know, like maybe I could change the mapping, you know, like I, I could also change the, the, the cue, you know, like I can really produce a very, very different uh, sound uh, with, uh, with uh, this very simple, very simple uh, uh, synthesizer. So, uh, can you show this petrol envelope of this, uh, Roma? What, sorry? Oh, sorry. Can you show the spectrum of uh, oh, this? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, for Thank some you. reasons, uh, you know, maybe it crashed. No? Okay. So I still have the... It's funny. So let me refresh the page. You probably noticed that once in a while, uh, the Faust Web ID crashes. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes it's not our fault. Uh, this time, I don't know if it was our fault or uh, Google Chrome's uh, or Firefox fault, sorry. Uh, but uh, there we go. So thanks for asking that question, Marina, because now we can see that very well. Like if I, if I press the gate uh, button, we can see all the harmonics like slowly appearing as the cutoff frequency is going up. So wow. And then when I release, they disappear, you know? And if I were to put a longer uh, uh, release uh, on my envelope generator, there we go. Cool. Uh, any, other, uh, any other question or? Cool, sorry, it's getting. Kind of well, actually, I have a question. Yeah. What What if you wanted that um, sweep to to like repeat over and over without hitting the button? It, it, it's a very good question, Julie, because that's exactly what I was going to talk about next. So. Great. <laughs> Great. That that thanks for thanks for asking that question. So. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, like Julie's question is, uh, how do we uh, further automate this uh, so that uh, uh, this will repeat over and over and over again? Okay, and uh, and so uh, so to do this, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, all I want to do is that uh, when I press on gate, um, I want gate to basically stop and start and stop and start and stop and start so that uh, my uh, my instrument is uh, automated. So uh, how do I do this? In, uh, in Faust, there is a function which is called pulse n. Okay, and, uh, and in fact, we're not even going to use Pulse N. I think I used Pulse N uh, in the uh, lab for uh, that very specific uh, demo. Uh, but uh, but I'm going to use Pulse uh, here instead. I'm looking at the lab and trying. Oh no, actually, I did use Pulse. Okay, so uh, so basically, uh, I'm going to multiply gate by uh, Pulse. Okay, and uh, you can see that Pulse is declared in basics.lib. Okay. And, uh, and if I go uh, on pulse, if I hover it, uh, I can see that the only parameter it has uh, is the period as a number of samples. Okay, so uh, so this is not necessarily uh, something very uh, understandable by uh, everyone here, but basically, uh, for now, I'm gonna give it uh, some kind of random number, and uh, and I'm gonna say that uh, the period is uh, like say ten thousand. Okay, and I, I will explain what this is after after that. Okay, so let me run it, uh, and uh, and then uh, and then I can comment on this. Okay, so currently uh, not much is happening because uh, I have a very short attack. So I'm gonna decrease uh, the attack, and I'm gonna decrease the uh, release as well. And uh, I don't get uh, I don't get any sound. 
Uh, why is that? Okay, let me let me refresh the page again. Maybe I'm just very unlucky right now. Maybe, maybe you want it to be a checkbox instead of a button now, or maybe you yeah, need to keep your mouse be... down, keep your mouse held down while you're holding it. Yeah, yeah, it should shouldn't be okay. I probably made a mistake then. Um, I mean, uh, you know, it, it should work uh, even if I'm not. Uh, even if it's not a checkbox uh, here. So uh, so why is this not uh, working? Okay, let me get rid of uh, the envelope uh, generator here for now and just say T, okay. Interesting. Okay, why am I not getting any sound anymore? Uh, so it's the demo effect. Okay, let me try to just uh, use uh, Sawtooth here without anything to see if. Okay, so I probably made a mistake then. Um, so, Oh wait, so currently, okay, so I guess should probably test this next. Okay, so if I run this, oh, well, yeah, sorry, sorry about that. That was kind of a, that was kind of stupid. Um, I, I know what the problem is, sorry. <laughs> so uh, basically currently, and, and that's actually a good, uh, that's actually a good mistake because uh, it's a good way to, uh, to explain it, okay. So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm using a pulse generator, okay? And uh, what a pulse generator is doing is that it's outputting a number, which is one uh, at a given period. And uh, the period is given as a number of samples here. So every 10,000 samples, I'm outputting one, okay? Uh, so in the case uh, of the previous synthesizer uh, where uh, I was using gate to control an ADSR and a little generator, when uh, I press on the key, uh, I need to leave my finger on the key so that uh, the ADSR lives its life, you know, and when I uh, release the key, then the ADSR stops, you know, and the release uh, begins and, uh, and then I don't get sound anymore. However, uh, here, um, I don't really have the concept of holding the key or not holding the key. So I, in fact, David uh, was kind of right uh, when, uh, when he gave uh, his uh, suggestion, you know, like of the checkbox in a way, you know, because uh, here, uh, because I'm going to automate things, uh, I can't really use an ADSR envelope generator anymore uh, because uh, there is the concept the concept of sustain here. And, uh, and because I'm not sustaining uh, anything by pressing the key with what I want to do, uh, I can't really use it anymore. Okay, so uh, what, uh, what am I going to do here uh, to fix this? You know, and, uh, and if you didn't get what I said, uh, then we can talk about it uh, again. But, uh, but basically, uh, instead of using an ADSR envelope generator, I'm going to use an AR envelope generator. And an AR envelope generator is an attack release uh, envelope generator. So it doesn't have a sustain. And, uh, and so uh, it has less parameters. So the, the first parameter is going to be uh, the duration of the attack. Uh, the next parameter is going to be the duration of the release. And I'm going to leave 0 0.1, for example, here. And then the last parameter is going to be the trigger. Okay. So basically what it does is that there is attack and then release. There is no sustain. You know, it just goes up and then down again. And whenever you send a trigger to it, it has a full life, okay? So it doesn't wait for uh, the trigger to get back to zero to start the release, okay? Uh, here, like when you uh, say uh, trigger, it just does the attack and then the release and that's done, you know? So here what happens is that we go from zero to one in 0 0.1 seconds and then we go back uh, to zero from one in 0 0.1 seconds. Okay, so uh, so let me uh, put back envelope here because I got rid of it before, and uh, and then uh, there we go. So now there we go. 
now I have uh, something that makes more uh, more sense. Okay, and uh, and uh, as David suggested, uh, we could probably replace uh, the button by a checkbox here, so that I can leave it on or off. Okay. So now I have something which is automated. Okay, so let me let me explain to you again uh, what's uh, what's happening uh, what's happening here. Okay, so uh, I wanted to show you the diagram, but maybe it's not a good idea. But basically, I have my checkbox, okay, which outputs zero or one, uh, one if it's on or zero if it's off. Then I multiply uh, the result of my checkbox, so zero or one, by pulse which is my pulse generator. Pulse just outputs one and then zero, 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 and then one. And the periodicity at which ones are generated is determined by uh, my period parameter, which is here. Okay, so here I, I output one every 10,000 uh, samples. And if you don't know what a sample is, uh, it doesn't really matter uh, because it's not going to prevent you from doing what you have to do in this class. So, uh, so I'm not going to, well, if you ask uh, what a sample is, I can uh, tell you what it is uh, during office hours, but, uh, but it's kind of a long uh, thing to explain. So, uh, so I'm not going to do this right away. Like, so those of you who don't know what a sample is, I invite you to go to office hours later today. Uh, is there, okay. Sorry, Roman, can you remind me what, what's the sampling rate here, a default sampling rate? Uh, is that 44.1? Yeah. So the, the sampling rate uh, in uh, the Faust web ID is 48 uh, kilo, uh, kilohertz. Uh, but that's only in the Faust Thank web you. ID. Uh, because that's the sampling rate of the web audio API. And the sampling rate of the web audio API is 48 uh, kilohertz. And I don't think you can change it. That's how it is. Uh, now, it's a good question that you ask Marina, because uh, in many cases, uh, you need to know the sampling rate um, within, your, uh, within your Faust uh, program. So, uh, so for example here, um, if we wanted to control uh, the periodicity at which uh, samples are uh, being uh, produced uh, using, uh, using uh, seconds instead of uh, number of samples, uh, all we could do, you know, is to say that uh, P, which is my period, okay, I'm creating a period parameter, uh, is equal, for example, to 0 0.5 seconds multiplied by the sampling rate. And the way you get the sampling rate in Faust is by uh, calling this variable, which is ma.sr, okay? And so, uh, so here you get the sampling rates uh, because, you know, like depending on the context in which your program is being executed, uh, the sampling rate might be, uh, might be different. And so, uh, so here uh, I'm saying that I want to output uh, uh, a click. So, uh, so I want to start a new note every 0 0.5 uh, seconds. So if I replace uh, this by P, okay, and uh, if I go back here, Okay, and then uh, if I want to do this every uh, 0 0.1 seconds, faster, okay? So uh, once again, you know, like all the stuff that we're doing today are sort of documented in your, uh, in your, uh, in the lab, you know, like, so, uh, so in the lab, I think I even did something slightly more uh, sophisticated where I'm using uh, BPMs uh, instead of uh, seconds uh, here. So we are formatting BPMs uh, using, uh, using the, using uh, using the sampling rates and uh, and so uh, so in fact uh, this is what uh, we have in line because uh, I have it here uh, and uh, and I'm gonna uh, just uh, use it here instead of what we have okay and uh, yeah this is my uh, trigger uh, signal okay and then uh, if I run the program now I can control the speed at which all these uh, notes are generated using my BPM parameter. Nice. So uh, 
what I just did here is something that we do a lot, uh, I think, uh, in uh, music technology. You know, like you write a program, uh, and then it makes a cool sound, and then uh, and then just for the sake of it, you're gonna you're gonna start playing with it, and uh, and it's very easy to procrastinate uh, when you do that kind of stuff. Because you know it's kind of satisfying to move the slider and generate uh, all these uh, funny uh, funny notes. So uh, anyway, are there any other questions about this or no? So uh, once again, you know, if uh, you feel like you're completely lost uh, with all this, uh, there are uh, solutions. <laughs> The first solution is go to office hours and ask your questions. And, uh, and the other uh, thing you have to know is that uh, in 250A, it doesn't matter too much if you don't understand all these things. You know, like here, I'm just trying to give you some uh, backgrounds on uh, sound synthesis and audio DSP. You know, like this is not a sound synthesis class. So, uh, so we're not gonna like evaluate you on uh, the, the sound you're going to, to, to make with your synthesizer, but more on your uh, instrument, you know, in the interface that is gonna come with it. So, uh, so, uh, so feel free to reuse uh, the starter codes, like feel free to use the examples uh, that we're giving you or the examples you're gonna find on the web because, uh, you know, like, we know that many of you are not necessarily like specialists uh, in sound synthesis, you know, like probably like very far from that. And, uh, and so we, we really don't care that much, you know, like about uh, you like writing complex synthesizers or whatever, you know, like as long as you can use them and, uh, and that you understand sort of how like they're built uh, without like going into too many details, you know, like that's, uh, that's all we uh, like, as long as you can get sound and get to where you want to go, you know, like with this, you're like, well, we'll be very happy. You know, like uh, once again, you're like, th this is not a Faust class or it's not a, it's not a sound synthesis class, you know? And uh, I just wanted to, to say that because I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, important that you get that. So, uh, cool. Hey, Ramon, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, what, what about if you wanted to like make a sequence, like, like an envelope that's a little bit more complex, it, can you just like take, um, a few ARs and like kind of put them in sequence with each other and then like at the end have the trigger and then that will be the you know then that will pulse like it will pulse like the sequence of the different ARs I'm, I'm just kind of trying to clarify that so, or and also like you know what if you don't want to go from zero to one you want to go to like 0.5 do you just like do like a times operation or something and like yeah absolutely yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, so to answer that last question yeah like if you didn't want to go uh well first you know like we're we're, we're actually doing it here you know like because because uh, currently because we have our gain slider here which is 0 0.5 uh we're actually multiplying uh the envelope by 0 0.5 so, uh, so we are doing what you're, uh, what you're just, uh, what you're just uh, saying here. Uh, then uh, the other, uh, the other question. Uh, I'm not sure I completely understand what you want to do. So, uh, so you want to, um, you want to parameterize the uh, the the like duration of attacks or whatever, or you want to put like. Uh, uh, you want to put like ADSR and little generators in series. That's that's what you're. Yeah, kind of like for an example, like you have it going from a point. Uh, the attack is in 0.1 seconds, and then the release is in 0.1 seconds. But maybe you have an attack with that, and then and then another one that goes afterwards. That's then the attack goes in like 0.5 seconds and 0.5 release, and then those two things are repeated. You, you know what I'm saying? Like in sequence. Because uh, yeah, that's like it, like okay, okay, you okay, just okay, okay. Yeah. yeah no no I I uh, I got it so uh, I think in that case uh, you don't necessarily want to use an ADSR uh, envelope generator and uh, and what you want to use is a breakpoint uh, function so uh, so if you want if you go in the Faust uh, libraries uh, documentation. 
And uh, if you search for uh, BPF, uh, which is, uh, I guess BPF is kind of a very, uh, okay, let me say break. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. So, um, so BPF uh, is sort of doing what you're saying here, you know, because uh, what BPF does is that it allows you to build your own envelope uh, and you can put as many points as you want in the envelope, okay? So basically what you say is that uh, you have a starting point uh, and, uh, and the starting point uh, is here. And then you have like another point and then another point and then uh, you have an end, okay? And so basically, actually, the ADSR envelope generator in Faust is built on a BPF. So uh, it's just that it's a BPF with, uh, you know, like one, two, three, four, and five points. Okay. So if you wanted to create uh, an envelope uh, which has more points than that, uh, and uh, and you know, like where you draw like something a little bit more complex than an ADSR uh, envelope, uh, then that's what you would, that, that's what you'd use basically like to, to do it. So uh, that, does that answer your question or? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So it's uh, like, I, I can't really like do it like right away because actually doing something as you're uh, describing uh, is a little bit more, um, complicated than everything that we're going to do in 250A, like, you know, because basically like the way you'd want to do it is first you want to create a counter and the counter is going to be uh, acting as a timer because here, like to do what you're saying uh, here, you need a timer because you, you need to know like uh, when, uh, like when this is this point or this point or this point or this point, et cetera. Right. And, uh, and so using a combination of the timer and of the breakpoint function, you can do what you're uh, describing uh, here. And, uh, and so, uh, so if you want to, if you want to have a good example of that, um, I recommend you to just look at the, the uh, implementation of the ADSR envelope generator in the Faust uh, libraries, because once again, that's how uh, the, the, AD, the ADSR envelope generator in Faust is actually built. Uh, it's using the BPF uh, function. So, uh, so just to clarify, um, Roman, the first variable is always a time variable. Is that correct? Like um, X zero and Y zero, the first one, X is a time, yes? No. No? no, 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 It's uh, so, you know, in, um, in Faust, uh, everything is a signal. So here, the breakpoint function uh, is just a, it, it is a breakpoint function, right? So, uh, so it's, a, it's a, a 2D space where you have X and Y points, okay? And, uh, and if you decide to map X, on time, you can, right? But it doesn't have to be time; <laughs> it could be anything. So, uh, so in in the case of an envelope generator, uh, what we do is that we would map x on time, and time would be a timer. Uh, so it, it would basically be a counter, and uh, and that counter would basically count samples uh, that elapsed in time. You know, so once again, like BPF uh, is, uh, can be used for anything, uh, not necessarily for what I'm talking about here, but if we uh, use uh, time in samples uh, for the X value, then uh, we can use it to create an envelope generator. So uh, uh, that, does that answer your Yes, question? thank you. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Once again, you know, like I mean, there's so much to say uh, about like all this and about Faust, you know, and uh, and uh, it's really really tough to do this in only uh, three uh, classes, you know, like kind of. But but once again, like don't don't worry, guys. Like if you're if you feel like you're lost here, it's not a problem. You know, like it's a uh, it's always that's uh, it's always been like that in this class. You know, like there are some people like who get like really scared uh, at the beginning of the quarter because they, uh, they don't know how to use like the sound synthesis tool that is used uh, as part of the class, you know, like, but once again, it's not a problem. Like it's not, it's not going to prevent you from doing the, the class. You know? So don't, don't worry. Uh, don't worry about it. 
uh, I'm saying that because we're talking about fairly technical stuff here, you know, and, and I, I understand that some of you might not know about like uh, what we're uh, talking about. So, uh, so it's uh, once again, it's a, uh, it's okay. Cool. All right. So uh, uh, one last uh, thing that I want to say here uh, is uh, that in Faust, uh, because it's a programming language, uh, it's uh, easy to iterate on things. You know, like so, it's easy to create uh, loops, and uh, and that's not something that we haven't done so far. So I wanted to show you how to do uh, how to do that. Okay, so uh, let me uh, create a slightly uh, simpler uh, program uh, here. I'm actually going to close this. Okay, and I'm gonna say that uh, process. Uh, you know, I, I'm gonna uh, get back to uh, what Luke asked about earlier, uh, which was the uh, harmonics and uh, the ability to create an additive uh, synthesizer uh, using uh, using harmonics. Okay. So uh, if you remember earlier, uh, we created an additive synthesizers uh, using uh, multiple sine wave oscillators in parallel. So we had a frequency and uh, okay, and uh, default 400, for example, 50, 1000, okay, and uh, 0 0.01. And I'm gonna smooth this guy out. Smooth. Okay, and uh, here I'm using freak. Okay, cool. So uh, so earlier we put multiple sine wave oscillators uh, in parallel, and then we multiplied freak by two, and we multiplied freak by three uh, here, and then we merged uh, those three oscillators into one oscillator and we divided the result by uh, three. Okay, good. So that's our uh, additive uh, synthesizer, right? So, uh... Okay, so uh... That's one way to write uh, things, uh, but it's not a very smart way uh, because I could, you know, automate uh, the fact that uh, these three oscillators are being declared in parallel, and uh, and uh, and I can make this programmatic so that I can control the number of oscillators that I'm going to have in parallel. So how do I do uh, that? Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of uh, those oscillators here, and I'm going to use a primitive in Faust which is called par, and it stands for parallel. Okay, so so here I'm going to say that I want to put things in uh, parallel. Okay, and so par uh, is going to take three arguments. The first uh, the first argument is going to be uh, a variable. Uh, that is going to store uh, the number of the iteration that we are uh, in at a specific point. Okay, so here I'm going to call it i. You know, so basically what I'm doing here is I'm creating a for loop, and uh, the i that I have here is the i in the for loop. Okay, uh, then I'm going to specify the number of iterations that I have, and I'm going to say three uh, because that's what I had before. And then the third argument is going to be the thing that I'm iterating on, okay? And uh, and it's going to be my sine wave oscillator. And uh, so here I'm going to close my parentheses, okay? And now I have my three, I have my three sine wave oscillators in parallel, okay? Uh, except that I still need to control the frequency of each individual sine wave oscillator so that. The first one uh, is has a frequency of freak. The second one is the frequency of freak multiplied by two, and the third one has a frequency of freak multiplied by three. And the way I do this is I basically just use i, okay? And i starts at zero, okay? So uh, so so here I have a frequency of zero, so that doesn't work. I don't want that. Uh, so I'm actually gonna add one to i. Okay, so that uh, in the first iteration, 
uh, I'm going to have freak multiplied by one, second iteration, freak multiplied by two, third iteration, freak multiplied by three. Okay. And, uh, and now if I run the program, still have exactly the same as what I had before. Okay. Now, if I want to add more oscillators, say if I want to have 10 oscillators, I just say 10. Now I have my 10 oscillators, you know, and, uh, and that's where things start becoming really powerful, you know, because, uh, you know, if you were in max MSP, it would be hard to do something like that uh, because you cannot like copy and paste things so quickly. You know, like, so in Faust, it's very easy to create uh, algorithms which are completely parametric uh, and, uh, and where you can iterate on something as I did, uh, as I did uh, here, you know, and uh... nice. So here uh, I have my uh, 10 oscillators in parallel and I'm adding them uh, into uh, one signal that I'm dividing by 10. Another way of doing what I just did here, uh, and uh, there is no better way, no, it's just a different way of doing it, uh, is to use another uh, iteration primitive part of Faust, uh, which is called the sum uh, uh, primitive. So here I put things in parallel, but instead of putting them in parallel, I could have summed them, you know, and then it works exactly the same way, except that, uh, let me reduce the number of uh, oscillators so that you can see it better. There we go. So basically uh, in that case, I don't need the merge anymore uh, because it doesn't make sense to merge it uh, anymore, right? But uh, I'm basically summing all these uh, five oscillators together. And the result is the same as what I did before, uh, where I had my oscillators, which were in parallel, and then merged into one, uh, one signal. Okay? Uh, and in Faust, uh, you have uh, four uh, iteration uh, primitives that you can use. Uh, you can use uh, par, as we saw before. You can use uh, sum. Okay? And uh, you can use uh, mult. Okay, uh, for multiply, uh, so so it's a product. Okay, so uh, so actually we can use it here uh, if you want to see the result. Okay, so so this is uh, uh, sorry, I, I think it's not mult, it's prod. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, and uh, so in that case we do uh, amplitude modulation, right? Doesn't really make any sense in that uh, in that case, okay. And the the final one is seek to create a sequence of something in parallel. And if I use seek uh, here, it's not going to work because my sine wave oscillators don't have an input. So for example, here instead of using oscillators, I could use filters. You know, so I could use my resin uh, LP filter, and uh, and uh, I could. Uh, reuse my frequency here, then I multiply by I plus one, as we did uh, before for uh, the sine wave oscillators, uh, give it a Q and give it a gain. And now, uh, oops, FI, now I have a sequence of filters, okay? So now I put five resonant low pass filters uh, in sequence. And if I wanted to have 10, uh, I could put 10 here. And there is no limit to that. You know, again, those uh, four primitives allow you to iterate on things uh, in fast. Cool. So uh, any, any questions on that? I mean, uh, it should be pretty straightforward. Uh, I hope. Uh, can, can you show one more time the um, amplitude modulation synthesis, the prod stuff? Yeah, so uh, once again, you know, like it, it's a form of amplitude modulation, but maybe it's not the best way to do amplitude uh, modulation. Like, I mean, uh, if you want to have like a good example of uh, amplitude uh, modulation, uh, you should look at the uh, starter uh, code. Uh, from this lab, you know, it's the Faust 250A starter codes. It's part of the lab. And, uh, and in there, there is an amplitude uh, modulation example. Uh, I'm opening it right now so that I can show you uh, on the screen. 
uh, there we go. I'm just taking it and I'm pasting it uh, here. Okay, so uh, so uh, let me just run it. Uh, okay, well, I made like a nice example here. Yeah, so, uh, so basically uh, what we're doing uh, in that example is that uh, we are creating an AM function. Okay, so amplitude modulation function. And, uh, and what we do is that we're just uh, multiplying a carrier by a modulator. And uh, the carrier is just a sine wave. And the modulator is a sine wave, you know, plus the typical amplitude modulation uh, formula that you would use for that. Okay. And, uh, and that's your, uh, that's your amplitude uh, modulation uh, plugin in, uh, in Faust. So, uh, so I said amplitude modulation for the product because in, in fact, it's what it's doing, right? Like if you multiply a bunch of sine waves together, it does like some kind of weird uh, amplitude modulation. But, uh, but I showed this example here because that one makes more uh, sense, uh, like as far as sound synthesis is concerned, like that's what we would do if we uh, said, like we do amplitude modulation uh, in sound. Uh, Synthesis. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. Uh, any other uh, any other questions on the previous example or? Cool. So um, I think we're we're done. You know, like for today's class. You know, like uh, and uh, once again, what I did is that I just uh, sort of tried to explain the examples from the lab. Uh, I'm sure many of you have more questions, so uh, I invite you to come to office hours to ask your Faust uh, questions. You know, and, uh, and uh, they're happening today uh, at 11:30. Uh, uh, is it 11:30? Sorry, yeah, I am. So, yeah, sorry, 11:30. Sorry, sorry, I, I'm because I know at what time they are for me, but. Uh, <laughs> I always forget at what time they are for you guys. So, uh, so it's at 11.30 a.m. But uh, um, on Wednesday, uh, we're going to do, uh, we're going to look at the kits and, uh, and I'm going to show you how to assemble your Teensy and that's going to involve some uh, soldering. So uh, the, the class will be recorded. Doesn't mean that you have to bring your soldering iron in class, you know, because I know that the soldering iron uh, situation is a little bit complex for those of you who live on campus, you know, like so. So uh, we don't expect you to assemble your Teensy in class uh, on Wednesday, but I will do it. Like I will show you how to do it, you know, and, uh, and then everything will be recorded and then you will have uh, slots that you can sign up for to go at the Robley gym to uh, to uh, do your soldering, you know. But uh, for those of you who have their soldering iron, uh, feel free to you know like uh, install them uh, for uh, Wednesday's class. You know, because maybe you can do it on the fly, uh, as I will uh, explain that to you. you know, like you know, but the goal of Wednesday's class is really like just to put together your Teensy and the audio shield and try to get audio out of it, basically. So. Uh, so, uh, so this is when we're going to start doing uh, hardware, where things are going to become uh, interesting. So, yeah, uh, cool. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. You know, otherwise, uh, I'll see you guys uh, in an hour during office hours. So. <laughs>